So hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for July 5th, 2013. Uh, so joining me this week, we have got Alan Boyle from, N from NBC's Cosmic Log. Live long and prosper. <laughs> uh, and we've got David Dickinson, aka hey. Astro Guys, from uh, everywhere. You right probably hear the rain in the background here. We got a bad storm passing over. Right yeah, now. your your weather has been changing. Uh, the brightness there has been changing quite a bit. So, um, so this week uh, we've got uh, new names for Pluto's moons, uh, the Phobos seen from the surface of Mars, uh, a really cool time lapse lapse of uh, comet Ison, uh, the Aphelion. Point, Apelian, which is, yep. Apelian, which is today, um, the that crazy Russian launch explosion, <laughs> uh, possible rescue efforts for the Kepler mission, and anything else that uh, that occurs to my attention deficit addled brain. So, uh, so let's start with uh, with Aphelion because that is the that's today, right? Yes, we just passed Aphelion a few hours ago at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 15, 1500 Universal Time. We are at our furthest point, farthest point from the sun uh, today. It may not seem it for Northern Hemisphere summer, anyway. Of course, it's winter down under. So, but we are currently 152,096,021 kilometers distant from the sun. We're about 3% dis difference from when we're at perihelion in January right now. So. But wait a minute, David. I thought that we <laughs> had winter when we're at the farthest away from the sun, and then summer when we're the closest. Uh, the, the irony, well, if you're in the southern hemisphere, that's true. In the northern hemisphere, the irony in the current epoch that we're in, it's actually the reverse. We're actually the furthest in the summertime. And this all leans into the what they call Milankovitch cycles because this does vary uh, very slowly over time where aphelion and perihelion actually do change. But right now we have what should be mild summers in the northern hemisphere because we're further away from the sun and we have harsher summers in the in the southern hemisphere around January time frame. Aphelion, oh go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say this This fact kind of points to uh, one of the head scratchers about how the seasons arise that uh, some, you know, some people ask that exact same question. How is it that I feel hot in the northern hemisphere when we're farther away from the sun? And, and David, you, you kind of touched on it when you yeah. mentioned that the difference is just 3%. Uh, yeah. The biggest factor is the tilt of tilt Earth of with respect axis. to the sun. Yeah, so yeah. that that's why where you know some of us might be sweltering at this point in the northern That's hemisphere. It. Yeah, That's and the... and Mars has actually a more eccentric orbit than Earth does and the difference in the sort of the winters and summers that it faces on its two hemispheres is is a lot more significant. So yeah. <clears throat> it's I'm Mar trying to think is it southern its southern hemisphere has much more severe winters than its northern I'm one. Pretty sure, yeah. In yeah. the, uh, it, it doesn't have a stabilizing moon like we do, so its axis varies over over thousands of years over a much wider span. than that's again related to the Milankovitch cycles, where the axis of the Earth is going from yeah. uh, from a high tilt to a low tilt. But our moon kind of stabilizes that a little bit. Now, is is it just a complete coincidence that it's close-ish to, I guess, to the summer solstice? In this epoch, yes. Right now, it's it's coincidence that we just happen to live in a time right now where they're very close. Uh, per Apihelion can vary between July second and July sixth. Uh, Apihelion, Apihelion. Yes. I got to get that. Not Aphelion. Apihelion. I know. It's it's always yeah, it, it is opposed to that's that's closest and furthest from the sun, and then you get into Perihelion with or Perigee, closest and furthest from the moon. Yeah. You know, uh, it took me a while when I wrote that article to wrap my brain around why it varies between July 2nd and July 6th, because I would have thought before I wrote that that it was just because of the leap years that, that cause it to offset as we're adding in leap years and subtracting it on our calendar, and that's not completely true. I found a, a thing on the, on the United States Naval Observatory site that was saying it's because the Earth and the Moon are going around a bare center. And the orientation when we reach aphelion with respect to that barycenter can matter within a few days wow. as far as as when we actually reach that point. And it's like I wouldn't have called that either, but that's actually the bigger oh, problem. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on. Now, now, Alan Boyle, now I know that you have powerful yeah. influence with the <laughs> International Astronomical <laughs> Union, and you are a gigantic uh, Star Trek nerd. 
Mm. And so you had been stuffing the ballot like crazy. You couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I couldn't get Pluto's moons. And I, like, and I like, I think if anyone needs to know that you're not on the payroll is the fact that you weren't <laughs> able to push through Vulcan as a name for Pluto's moons. Uh, I could not make it so. You could not sure. make it so. <laughs> so, and, so what and neither could all those voters I who, who uh, pushed uh, Vulcan up to number one on the Pluto Rocks vote uh, back in, in February. Instead, we have, you know, sticks for the rock fans. I was going to say. Cur yeah, <laughs> and, and Kerberos for the computer nerds who yeah, uh, that's a security so. uh, protocol, I think. Yeah, so yeah. you know the Trekkies might be, or Trekkers, I should say, might be a little bit disappointed for now, but there are other niche groups that uh, are probably pretty happy about these two moon, uh, Isn't... these two names for Pluto's fourth and fifth moons. So what are all the moons that we've got? Nix, Hydra, and Sharon, Sharon. Sharon. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure. And uh, and now uh, sticks and Kerberos, and uh, David, you were talking about the Barry Center. Uh, Barry Center is the kind of gravitational point around which uh, that uh, that system of planets, whether it's the Earth and the Moon, or whether it's Pluto and all those other uh, little worlds out there. That's that's kind of the center point, and uh, and the Barry Center for Pluto and Charon is actually outside the sphere of Pluto and so really? some people have have talked about Pluto and Sharon should really be considered uh, a double planet system yeah. uh, I, I, yeah. I'm not ready to I'm not ready to go that far I, I just you know that's that's too much for my head to ra wrap around <laughs> but uh, another little angle is that even if you're disappointed over Vulcan not being chosen as as the name there's still a chance there are lots of things that people are going to be naming on Pluto once the New Horizons probe goes by in 2015, and so who knows? There might be a big volcano that they could name Vulcan. And, I'm saying uh, that. I'm still saying that. <laughs> right, yeah. some kind of cryovolcano. Right, yeah, and, yeah, and uh, Mark Showalter, who was kind of had the head of the Discovery team and had this all organized, suggested that we might have uh, McCoy, Sulu, Spock, and Kirk craters <laughs> right. uh, on Pluto, or well, e even a Mickey Mouse uh, complex of craters that that look like a big head with two mouse ears. Well, I mean, we think about the fact that we're discovering uh, all of these moons. Sorry, I'm just a talking screenshot now. Uh, when you consider the fact that, the, that we've discovered all of these moons already with the Hubble Space Telescope from this distant range, when New Horizons makes that right. pass, yeah, it's probably going to turn up a bundle more moons, and then all of those are back on the table and more. I think yeah. we're, you know, we need a Riker, we need a Picard, <laughs> you know, I think we need all of these right. objects to be named, because we're not going to get another chance to to but, but, explore so close. But Fraser, you have to keep in mind that there are, there are rules when it comes to naming moons, and this is the big reason why they didn't go with uh, Vulcan. One of the big reasons is that you have to have something that has a connection to the underworld or Pluto. And even yeah. though uh, Vulcan was Pluto's nephew, uh, they it's figured that wasn't quite close enough. Yeah, it, 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 under the ground, is any Vulcan? I think I think they could have pulled it off. I think it's it's good enough. But I I like sticks and. Herberous. I dig sticks. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I gonna uh, turn up, uh, you know, sticks greatest hits and, and rock <laughs> think, out to that. I think William Shatner's still upset from what I saw in his tweet stream that J.J. Abrams destroyed Vulcan in the first movie. So, right. Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, you know, beware the wrath of Shat. So <laughs> I think if the IAU thought Alan Stern and the Pluto guys were bad, just wait until you get William I, Shatner and Leonard Nimoy after you. Yeah, I, I think if they can somehow get uh, Stephen Colbert on their side, then they'll <laughs> absolutely just destroy, I, I think. I, I had a very brief proposal in for, uh, and Alan Stern did take notice of it and replied back to me to name one of the moons Electo with a CT because the CT would honor Clyde Tombaugh you know, kind of in, oh, a, in a surreptitious way. He said he would consider it, and it was on the running, but it didn't get a lot of votes. I didn't and have a, I didn't have a Starfleet captain to back me up. So. But is there is does Electo have some kind of? Yes, uh, Electo is one of the Furies uh, from oh, okay. Greek mythology. Okay. And there, the one pro, the only drawback is there's an asteroid named Electo, but they're using a KT spelling, a Greek spelling. So I had proposed the the Roman spelling of it to kind of get it in there and honor Clyde Tombaugh, but you know. 
there's still yeah. there's still more moons coming. So yeah, Who that's knows? that's what they did with Kerberos. Is that there's already an asteroid named Cerberus, yeah, I uh, that. which is the more common uh, yeah. spelling. And so what they did is they just tweaked it so that you use the Greek spelling for Kerberos, which is the three-headed dog that guards uh, the river Styx to make sure that nobody gets out of hell. Yeah. I think Cerberus Cerebus was an, a comic book about an aardvark. But that, can just be <laughs> uh, that is because I used to work in a comic book store. Okay. Uh, wow, we, I, I did not know that. Did, didn't know that? Yeah, I worked at the... You're, I, you're a comic book guy. I worked... Yeah. <laughs> I worked at the, at the comic shop in Vancouver for about, oh, cool. uh, for about four years, yeah. I was actually the games, the, the role-playing games guy and the science Excellent. fiction guy, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, uh, let's talk about uh, you know what I want to talk about your your article on Kepler. So let's talk about the the sort of the 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 yeah. state of Kepler and the sort of the ways that they're going to try and recover it. And let me preamble that by what a horrible tragedy Kepler uh, losing sort of you know losing Kepler would be because it is turning up thousands, ten ten thousand you know candidate planets. This will suck if we lose this spacecraft. Yeah, people who are watching Weekly Space Hangout probably all, all know about Kepler, but uh, it's, the, it's a space telescope, basically, that looks for the signs of planets beyond our own solar system by searching for the telltale dips of light as a planet goes across the uh, disk of its parent star. And in May, they announced that uh, there were they lost too many reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are kind of like gyroscopic thingies that enable a spacecraft to stay very stable so that it can stare at a particular star and look for that very telltale dip. And so if they don't have that fine pointing ability, you can't look for planets. And so uh, they needed three out yeah, of uh, four, and they only have two. So the issue is trying to get one of those reaction wheels started again. And so they've been trying to work out a strategy to do that. And they say that they are testing the strategy right now on the ground with a test article. And they're going to try to start the process of getting those wheels restarted uh, somewhere around mid-July or late July. And it's a low percentage shot because uh, one of the wheels has been on the blink for, uh, for more than a year. And so... Uh, they're not sure whether they can really get that started again. It's like a creaky old thing, you know, something on your on your car <laughs> that you want to get rolling. And so what they're going to try to do is send commands to wiggle uh, one of the wheels back and forth. If, if it doesn't work with that one, they'll go to the next wheel and try that. But in any case, uh, Kepler has outlived its three-and-a-half-year primary mission. It's on an extension right now, and they've got lots of data that will keep them busy for years. And so uh, don't mourn even if they can't get it started don't mourn for the Kepler mission because its legacy will continue and we'll be hearing a lot uh, about a lot more planets and planet candidates in the months and years to come yeah absolutely but I mean the real issue here is that you know to really find those earth-sized worlds you need three years of solid data maybe more if you really want to confirm mm -hmm. your discoveries and so we're just at this sort of sweet spot sure and now with the, so I want I want to show you something this is awesome so <laughs> a, a fan of of universe today like okay so in, in, in any episode we talk about uh, on on sorry on astronomy cast we talk about problems with the uh, you know with these missions and they always seem to lose their gyroscopes Hubble's losing gyroscopes and I say you know Send more reaction wheels yeah exactly if, if I was you know <laughs> if I was on the uh, you know on the Mission Pilot, like, have you got enough gyroscope? <laughs> and you know, let more. You, you know, let let you know. Yep. Uh, it's like more cowbell. You, yeah, exactly. You want more and gyroscopes. So, right. And so, Kamika Ying, who's a fan of of Astronomy Cast, uh, sort of did a 3D graphic for me of <laughs> what they're calling. Let me just give it here. It's called the Terrestrial Planet Finder Gyroscope <laughs> Array. <laughs> so, oh, so, cool. so what this is, it has 16 gyroscopes on board. 16, and yeah. it's designed to find uh, planets, terrestrial planets. So I think at that point, <laughs> this thing will fail. go for thousands of years. I need more gyroscopes, I man. Need, yeah, so, <laughs> so this is it. If you need three, you'd at least have six. So have a backup so, yeah. for each one. <laughs> yeah, so this is it, the Terrestrial Planet Finding Gyroscope Array. I think that is the, that is <laughs> the machine that will... It's gyroscopes all the way down. It, it absolutely <laughs> is. Yeah, let me give you another, another view of this here, because I think it, I just love it. Um, now here's another view of it. Okay, hold on. 
Um, that one here. Yeah, so you can nice. really see all you can see all those gyroscopes there. Yeah. So we need some kind of acronym. That's like a TPGA. We need, we need to come up with some yeah. kind of clever, clever yeah. spell. Yeah, there. so that's it. So I think, you know, I mean, I think anytime anyone's going to send a new mission up, they just need to give me a call and, like, I forget, Fraser, what, what do we always need? More gyroscopes. More reaction wheels. More yeah. reaction wheels. That please. could be the next Kickstarter. Be the next, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will, you <laughs> know, I will goal. send up. Yeah, stretch goal. Right. If we, <laughs> if we make our stretch goal, we will add another gyroscope and then the, you know, another reaction wheel and the thing will work longer. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I think it's great. I mean, there's been a bunch of missions, though, where they've come up with these really clever methods for being able to make the spacecraft work with less reaction wheels than they were they were expecting, either um, uh, using, in some cases, like the magnetic field of the Earth or being able to use, uh, you know, pressure from the sun or just being able to just sort of work with two and kind of the way they're kicking, you can kind of add a third dimension to it. But I think the problem here is that you need, you know, it's not like rough turning. You need really precise, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's got to be perfect. And you really need those those reaction wheels to be going. Tess is our next exoplanet hunter in the pipeline. 2016, 2017, I believe it's launching. I'm going to we'll look right now and see how many reaction wheels it's got. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what's cool? What's cool with Tess is unlike uh, Kepler's only looking at, at one slice of the of the sky, and Tess is going to be an all sky, pretty much an all sky instrument. So we're going to be able to. And examine it's, a lot it's more designed space. to look for uh, for yeah. exoplanets that are relatively nearby too, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that would be good. Sandy. Yeah, I'm seeing. Oh, there's Sandy. Awesome. Um, I'm seeing four. Tess is going to have four reaction wheels, and oh, I can tell you big that mistake. is that is not yeah. enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they need uh, they need a bunch. Hey, Sonny, can you hear us? Okay, we can't hear you. It's probably because you're muted when you first joined the recording. Sorry, our, uh, our I went over to troubleshoot some klystrons and and something. Uh, there, one of our transformers is humming, and it shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> How many people can say, "Oh, I'm just troubleshooting some klystrons"? No, that's the kind of problem. That's, that's pretty have. cool. I don't, Not I don't enough. I don't even know what a klystron is. What is that? It is like a light bulb for radio waves. <laughs> I it, still it, don't even know what that is. It, sounds it, like makes, a it makes radio or... waves out of a lot of electricity. <laughs> that, that works. Yeah. yeah. Sixty-five thousand right. volts, which you know is not you know okay, whatever. The voltage isn't going to kill you, but it's the thirty-three amps that's going to kill you. <laughs> um, Two megawatts. Okay, I'll shut up now. So, so no, 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 no. We love the live in your face reality of being at the world's <laughs> largest uh, radio observatory. Yeah, I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna finish on time. It's like, nope, we just just lost something. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining. So, so everyone, this is Sandy Springman from the Arecibo Observatory. Uh, we have already talked about the names of Pluto. Are you? Do, oh, you, do you approve of the Pluto names? I like the names of Pluto's moons. They're okay. very Greek. They fit in with the cosmic scheme. And I love the name Kerberos because I'm an MIT alum. And Kerberos is the authentication and security software we use at MIT. So I think it's a great name. I right. want to get a stuffed three-headed dog toy. <laughs> um, and we also, what else did we talk about? We talked about the fact that it's Apelian Day. Happy Apelian, Apelian Day. You're further from the sun. And how that uh, you may is not a problem. Feel it. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about the the Russian launch explosion. I will see if I can find a it's uh, Soviet Russia. Yeah, the, yeah the, and I will the see. The video can... was pretty amazing, uh, and uh, when we were watching it, it was kind of one of those like I can't actually believe this is happening. It was uh, we were watching? It was about maybe two or three of us watching that launch on July first on Monday night, and it was just a standard. They were launching uh, Glossnast GPS satellites, no big deal. Proton M rocket out of Baikonur. And about two or three seconds after it came off the pad, we saw it start to sway in one direction. I thought, okay, it's kind of peeling over to reach orbit. Then it bounced back, and I'm like, that's not normal. And then yeah. once it started spinning... And, and when it uh, turned upside down, uh, yeah, I, I, that like, was that's the big definitely boom. not normal. So yeah. it's, uh, we, we ended up spending about another, uh, another hour online trying to uh, stitch together some video off the, the, the GIFs that everybody had from screenshots. To, to, and actually follow if thankfully nobody was hurt. We didn't know that at the time because it looked like it went right back into the right back into the structures there when it, when it it was interesting they cut the feed about two or three seconds after that happened too. The live feed we were watching just went blank as soon as that went out. And I mean we haven't seen that 
in a while. I mean, Baikonur, was, I think it was 2005, 2006, they had their last major uh, disaster there. And and someone mentioned that there should be um, a range, you know, a, a range officer keeping an eye on these things, you know. And there's no self-destruct there, mechanisms on these yeah, rockets. Let me, yeah. let me see if I there's can not, not, on, not on the Russian launches. There's not on the Russian protons. On the American launches, yes, they they have a, a, right. an auto destruct. What, that, that's been... uh, that's the profile for uh, a launch aboard is that they command the rocket <laughs> to head out, you know, they, a couple of kilometers and yeah, then cut cut off have... the engines. They do have some maneuverability with it. Uh, ironically, this was almost to the day the anniversary of the disaster of the N1 rocket, the Proton rocket, in 1968. Okay, I'm gonna tried to launch to the moon. That was July 3rd, I believe it was. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna screen share this and let's see if this works. And then I'm also gonna say hi to Dr. Thad Zabo. <laughs> hey, who's outside? Hey, and you 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 might give us the sun. If this cloud gets out of the way and okay. I can get, uh, actually no, it's gotten more cloudy since I've gotten set up here. So okay, well here let's let's watch this. Uh... <laughs> you you may be able to see on this video too. One of the engines I've watched it several times. You can see one of the engines start to smoke as it takes off. Too. I think they had an engine failure. That's that's just me. That's nothing official. Uh, I think they had one of their motors burn out. This is bad. Yeah, oh, you're bad. Yeah, that's that is not good. <laughs> Uh, Sandy rates it. One thumbs down. <laughs> oh, there it goes. It's like watching a Top Gear space shuttle launch, but worse. And there's there's no word right uh, right now. All the protons are grounded, and they're doing an investigation. So that's were, going were you to able to hear the... there, yeah. there was no sound on the launch. Okay. On the on the launch video, there was there was no audio to it. It was just uh, it was just straight video. There was no commentary or anything. Uh, the the next proton launch was slated to be July twentieth. Was that? Oh, here, hold on. There's more here. But that's all been put on hold. So, there was another video I found. I think it was just shot by uh, somebody who was observing it. That that did have sound, and you got a nice delay between when uh, yeah when it hit the ground and and when the sound finally reached the observer. Thankfully, they were you know far away enough that that took about twelve to fifteen seconds. Yeah. There were a few deltas out of the Cape they had to do command destruct on back in the 90s. I don't think we've had a disaster like that here on the Space Coast for some time. Um, and, and that cloud of uh, uh, rising up from the crash uh, contains a lot of toxic, uh, you know, propellant uh, stuff. Yeah. So I I, the uh, yeah. there was some concern about uh, what was going to happen to that cloud, but I haven't heard. Uh, at at one time, they had people in Baikonur closing their windows and trying to stay indoors, but uh, I haven't heard whether uh, there's been any there have been any further repercussions. But this is yeah. not good, uh, you know, in terms of relations between Russian <laughs> space agency and the Kazakh officials, where Russia yeah. has its main spaceport right now. Now the the progress uses a Soyuz rocket, so it's a different one. But uh, this may bump back the July twenty seventh progress launch, the next one to the ISS too. I, right I for noticed, de for decam decontamination of the launch pad, I think. Yeah, I, I noticed all their launches from Baikonur say to be de determined on the dates right now over on uh, space flight now. So I think it's going to shuffle their launch schedule quite a bit while they're investigating this. One. It it looked and now did they actually detonate it? I mean, it looks like someone must have pulled the trigger and made it. Blow up because it. I, I don't think they did. I, everything I heard on on their their news said they don't have the remote detonation capability on their rockets. They do have, uh, like Alan was saying, they have the capability to maneuver them off off range to a safe site. But that's about all they they have control over when they go up. That didn't that didn't look like they were had any ability to maneuver it. Yeah. You know, it just it looked like it was just. It's theoretical <laughs> maneuverability. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as and much I mean, you, they can. you can imagine. I mean, that thing. If it had come this way, <laughs> right I towards know. the camera crew. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how far away they were from the, no, the site, I, but I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, during the Cold War, they had several disasters there at Baikonur where they they had several dozen fatalities over the years. Uh, that that N one failure in sixty eight was one of the worst. I can't remember how many people died in that, but. That was one right before uh, Apollo 11 went to the moon that they were trying to launch a payload with a, with a dummy mass to go out around the moon, and that was destroyed. It was one of their enormous N1 moon rockets was destroyed right there on the pad. That was one of the biggest disasters they ever had at Baikonur. If that hadn't happened, they would have, Soviets would have beat the Americans to the moon? 
I, mm-hmm. I think they were still they were behind already at that point. It was a hail yeah, mary. At that point. Yeah. Right. But there wasn't anybody on the N1. It was just a test, right? That was a test launch. Right. Yeah, but so. it killed a lot of people on the ground. Yeah. yeah. I think there might there was one of their launches. They might have had like some some turtles and some some live animals that they wanted to send around the moon and back. I think they were trying to send that. Might have been that mission. Yeah. I mean, we call that a Hail Mary, but if you look at how Apollo 8 was structured, I mean, that's, you know, that's yeah. about as close to a Hail Mary as you get to. A complete test of a, of a totally assembled launch vehicle um, with a crew to go out and orbit the moon for the first time. So, you know, that was, that was only the, what, the th- I think it was only the third time the, uh, the Saturn V had been, been launched, if I remember correctly. I often so. think Apollo 8 was one of the more dramatic missions, even more than 11, actually, from what they were trying to do at the time. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on and let's talk about uh, something in Sandy's territory, which is uh, Comet Ison. I know it's an it's a comet, not an asteroid, but it's going to be the comet of the century, right? Right. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be super exciting. Uh, or not. I mean, Hubble, hope. Hubble's already gotten photos of it, right? It was... Yeah. So I was going to show that. I'm going to show this cool time lapse of the. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Ison's currently on the other side of the sun right now, so the, the big question mark's going to be what it looks like when it comes around in late August. We're, we're probably going to pick up the news cycle on Ison again. So as we like to say around here at Arecibo Observatory, comets and cats have a lot in common. <laughs> they both have tails, and they do exactly what they want. So it could be by the time that this comet comes back around our side of the sun that it could be a total dud, or it could be completely exciting and absolutely beautiful. I'm hoping for the latter, personally. <laughs> I don't like duds. Yeah. I think well, why, being... I mean, we, we've talked about this a bit already. Why do, why are astronomers kind of thinking this might be interesting? It's going to be big. It's going it, to, it's going to have a really long tails, to, a long tail as well. Mm-hmm. If it survives perihelion, it will have a great comet. If it goes around the sun and doesn't come back out, we're going to have a dud. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's coming around for the first time, people believe, uh, from the Oort cloud, which is this big reservoir of comets on the solar system's rim. So uh, it's, storage, it's, a virgin, it's a virgin comet, and it's going to get really hot. Uh, it'll be uh, coming within, what, uh, uh, 700,000 miles or 1.1 kilometers of the sun when it makes its round, and so that that classifies it as a sun grazer, and as, as David was saying, uh, it could be quite spectacular if it does survive that sun grazing course. And so if it, if it does get torn apart, does that just make it better? Mm. Mm, it'll probably be like Ellen, and, <laughs> it, Ellen it and was a few years ago. Yeah. It depends on exactly how it's torn apart. I mean, if it completely disintegrates, all right, now it's a complete dud. If there's something that just causes some fracturing in it and you end up with four or five or however many cometary nuclei, now that's rare. That doesn't usually happen with a sun grazer. But if it does, now now you've got four or five comets that have just passed very near the sun in the sky. I doubt that's a... a a very strong possibility, though, because usually something you know starts approaching the sun, it just completely disintegrates. But I mean, you know, if there's this whole range of kind of hopefulness with comets, right? The 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 one where it makes it around the sun fine, and you get this gorgeous tail stretching over about a quarter of the sky, which would be possible from a, a comet like this. To okay, well, it completely fizzles out. Um, what I'm proposing is even farther to that hopefulness side. It's like okay, now we've got three or four or more cometary nuclei, each with their own tail. Again, very, very unlikely, but you know, it's it's worth throwing out there. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to point out there were no hot pixels chasing uh, Comet Ison this time around, too, on this latest animation, like there was the the one we had a few months ago that sparked a lot of the, the conspiracy controversy about uh, people were trying to resurrect the ghost of Hale Bop and say, something's following Comet Ison, and NASA's trying to hide it. <sighs> Well, I mean, well, NASA just, you know, used Photoshop and removed all the oh, the, the following <laughs> UFOs. I so everyone loves the a space good cats. conspiracy theory. Yeah. yeah. Space yeah. cats. I mean, there was a something going around a while ago that we were tracking um, Nibiru for the, the end of the world at the end of last year. Right. Right. That's yeah. what's that's what's bad though is they're not even being original anymore. They're recycling. That's so 2012. I mean, it's 2013. <laughs> so 2001 <laughs> is what it is. Um, now, now, Sandy, if uh, if it does sort of make its pass, will you guys be observing it once it sort of crosses from the sun? What kinds of 
you know, we will hopefully be hitting it with radar later this year. And the interesting thing about comets, I don't know if you've seen some of my the radar spectra that I post on Twitter. They kind of look like a they look like a bump. Well, with a comet, it looks like a bump or a Gaussian with wearing a skirt because of <laughs> all the all the whatever is happening in the coma, whatever is happening in the the tail. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, and so I mean, we can we can get an idea of how big it is. And really, all comets are different. Everything everything is you know some are bigger than others. Some produce more of these volatiles than others. Comets are a very diverse crowd. And what was the last really spectacular comet? Hale Bopp, maybe the one that was Hale Bopp for Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah Southern yeah. Hemisphere has had a pretty good run with Comet yeah, Lovejoy Joy and McNaught. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this will be it. This will be our us our Northern Hemispherical uh, chance to see a really bright comet or not. Yeah, it'll be visible in the dawn sky in December. So we hope. Yeah. I've uh, got a question here from Hugo Burnham. Uh, irrespective of whether icing is spectacular or not, are we going to learn anything from it? Well, think... so if, we're, if, it's a, if it's a relic of the Oort cloud, I think fight seeing a comet that's relatively unprocessed, seeing the relative abundances of volatiles, uh, looking at its uh, nucleus, looking at its coma, how that all behaves, hopefully something that's so fresh, I think that you're going to learn a lot, sort of, hopefully about the Oort cloud. Right, and so we haven't seen a lot of these up close. Right, I think this is one of the first ones that we know definitely is an Oort cloud refugee. Someone should get a spacecraft out to that thing right now. <laughs> well, actually, uh, there, there, uh, a lot of researchers are uh, setting up this website, isoncampaign.org, to help coordinate observations so that uh, everyone can work together. And, and so I think that's going to be one of the websites to watch as we get close to uh, perihelion and I believe, uh, observations. I believe Curiosity is going to get a look at this one, too. And there's another one coming by Mars in 2014. So. Oh, that's right. That's right. There's going to be a comet that's going to come pretty close to Mars, I, maybe I think, even crash into it, right? I, there was, I, I don't think it's going to crash now. It's not going to crash into it. Yeah, they've ruled that out. Yeah. Oh, well. But, so. it, but it is going to get a look at Ison, too. I believe Curiosity might be able to... It may be the first comet image from another planet, from the surface of another planet. So. Um, okay, so uh, next up, I think we're going to talk about a story that you actually worked on, Alan, about uh, a new SETI network. Oh, just that uh, the uh, a group of British astronomers announced today at the National Astronomy Meeting uh, in St. Andrews, Scotland, uh, uh, a new initiative to uh, get the UK more involved in SETI research. And Sandy, uh, you'll find this interesting. I'm sure that uh, they want to get uh, E. Merlin, this this uh, network of uh, radio telescopes in Britain, uh, more on the case for for looking for signals from uh, extraterrestrial civilizations. So we'll see. Jodrell Bank, uh, which is one of the big telescopes in, in Britain, uh, was involved in Project Phoenix, which is the SETI Institute's uh, SETI campaign, uh, back uh, 10 years ago or so. Uh, but they, they want to get more into it. And the whole issue is, uh, where's the money going to come from? So they're going to put in a proposal for somewhere around 250000 to $1.5 million, see if they can get some money from uh, the funding agencies in Britain. That'll be, uh, I, I think that might be a little bit of a long shot, that uh, governments are, have been a little loath to be perceived as funding the search for little green men ever since Sounds NASA like was cut off. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Kickstarter. Get, uh, you know, get some famous British physicist maybe to get behind Sun it. Brian. Brian uh, something or other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, and I think he could probably. I'd say that's a capital idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he could he could single handedly uh, push that thing forward. So into a Kickstarter territory, no problem. But is our SIBO totally out of the SETI business now? Um, yeah, there hasn't, I don't think there's been much SETI going, I've only been here for nine months, so I'm, there was this wow signal transmitted last year, but I don't think there's a lot of, I don't think there's a lot of transmitting in, uh, in terms of let's, let's try to uh, approach some extraterrestrial civilizations if they do exist these days. 
So there isn't the chance for a plucky young uh, radio astronomer to use time <laughs> off, uh, you know, in between I, I'm sorry, times I don't have my headphones. To, to sit out with her headphones and listen to the uh, to the sounds of the Arecibo Observatory. From Vega, I, I, can, I can I can show you the the tile in here. It's the exact same one that was in the Contact movie in this control room. Oh but, really? Yeah. Yeah. No one no one sits with headphones and listens for LGM. <laughs> I see I think that's it. They've just they've lost the spirit of it. You, now. you need more headphones. More headphones. <laughs> that's we still when... drive around in those red diesel jeeps that were in the film and we still grouse at the director about money and telescope time. So things things haven't necessarily changed so... all that much. Yeah. Uh, oh, a Andy Crowley recommends Brian May. So I think that's a great example too. That between the two of them, Brian Cox, Brian May, they'll they'll push the uh, this Kickstarter forward. We'll support it. I'll, I'll kick in 25 bucks. Done. I will. There you, there you go. I, I bought into ARCID. I will buy into your um, into your SETI program. Uh, so British SETI people, call me. Um, uh, for my $25. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Now, now, one thing that we've never done, uh, but I have decided that we should do it, um, one is, uh, is what are some upcoming things that people may want to sort of steal themselves for in the next couple of weeks? Does anyone know of anything that's happening? And I know I didn't prepare you for this. <laughs> well, we got a few good conjunctions coming up in the skies, talking about as far as observationally. Uh, uh, Venus is going to be passing very near Regulus, and uh, Mars and, and Jupiter are going to be in conjunction, I think, on the 22nd, early in the morning. Uh, there's the Perseids, but that's still, sure. I guess, about that's a month in August. away. August. But I think if you haven't, I mean, it really, if you haven't already booked some kind of vacation to go somewhere dark and take your family and watch the Perseids meteor shower, you need to that's, get on that right that's, now. That's what's like the old faithful of meteor showers. Perseids never disappoint. So that's yeah. one for Northern yeah. Hemisphere viewers. It's one of the big three or four. And this year, I believe the, the moon is going to be very close to new. So the moon phase is favorable this year, too. So we, we don't have a full moon to contend with this year. Yeah. Yeah, new moon is on August 6th. So it will be just before first quarter, first but that quarter. means it'll be set by about midnight, 1 a.m. Hey, where's that Phases of the Moon app? <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. And, uh, and yeah, so it should be out of the sky for the best time of the shower. Yeah. yeah so Favorable year. <clears throat> yes. Any launches coming up? Isn't there a... Wasn't there there is a uh, launch coming up? They just launched. Oh, they, they just launched, launched uh, yeah. yesterday. There was a suborbital launch out of Wallops. They've been trying to send that one up for a couple weeks, so... Uh, I know there's a progress heading up to the ISS on the 27th. There's no manned launches that I can think of this month. There, there's some, some small, like I said, the ones out of Iconor are all on hold because of the disaster this week. So I can't think of any high-profile launches. Summer, July and August tends to be a little bit more of a wound-down time yeah. as far as yeah. space. There are a couple of spacewalks that are scheduled over the next month, you know, in July. But uh, I don't know. Spacewalks are just seeming to become sort of routine. Uh, we we don't even report on them anymore. I feel really when bad. When there's we, a contingency spacewalk, is what the yeah. Hybrid. When there was that. Yeah, when, when there was that. Leak. Yeah. When there was that. Um, yeah. That leak on the space station. We reported on that. But but if it's just like a routine spacewalk, we actually don't even do articles on Universe Today anymore. I feel bad. Like I'm not a mm. patriot or something. Um, uh, okay, well then let's uh, let's wrap things up then. So, uh, and were there any questions that I actually that I had? Uh, actually, there, this was interesting. This might be a good one for for Doctor Zabo, which is um, from Braga Jaga asks, why does the moon have all bowl shaped craters? If the moon went through Great Bombardment Crater, why are there no oblique craters? It looks like all the rocks entered at ninety degrees. Highly unlikely, don't you think? Well, the thing is, with uh, you, you can test this. You can can go into a lab and set up, you know, some sort of thing that has about the density of the moon and smash things into it at different angles. You have to come in at an angle of less than five degrees to get an oblique crater. Anything that comes in at five degrees or more actually produces a round crater, and and this is largely due to the the interaction of. Um, when you're heating just that, that tiny area of the, the surface, when the, even a large thing comes in, that heat propagates out spherically. And so when that region of the moon essentially turns to, goes from rock to gas, it blows out something that is either bowl-shaped or they're finding cone-shaped is actually um, the, 
the way that uh, craters form before they start to decay through um, erosion or having other meteorite impacts nearby. So yeah, you have to have this incredibly low impact angle. And I think Schiller is one example of a, of a crater that is more oblique, more kind of oval shaped than um, having spherical symmetry to it. But yeah, it's very rare. And essentially, if something's coming in that low, it's practically missing, right? It, it only has to come in a little bit lower, and then it just kind of skims over the surface. And you know, if there was anything to observe it, it'd be like, "Wow, that thing got close." But uh, but yeah, yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's very difficult to hit at that shallow an angle. Right. And so, just no matter what you get, as soon as it hits, it forms a nice circle, and that's Pretty just much. yeah, yes. yeah. And that's why they all look like circles because no matter what angle they came in at, they just form a circle. Right. Um, and same here on Earth, right? I mean, even even worse because they can right. skip off the atmosphere or they collide with the planet. Right. There's some oblique ones on Earth, but they're very rare. I think there's some up in the Canadian Arctic that are oblique, that are kind of oval shaped. But yeah. And then skipping off the Earth's atmosphere is, you know, again with the with the Moon, you come in at a very shallow angle. Well, there's nothing to stop it. You come in at a shallow angle from the Earth, and you get something like the Chelyabinsk. Um, asteroid, which you know had this nice long path through the atmosphere, which allowed it to burn up and only injure a few hundred or a few of, of a couple, about a thousand people, as opposed to what would happen if it came in at a steeper angle. Yeah, it was Is 1972. That... There was one over the Grand Teton Mountains that got videoed in Cal mm. out in the out west that skipped off that didn't impact. Um, so Hugo Burnham asks, do you think that New Horizons will reveal Pluto to look a lot like Triton? I've heard that said before, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think so, for sure. Yeah, um, so for uh, people who don't know, no, Triton we... is, what, Neptune's largest moon? Yeah. And it, and right. it and orbits it... backwards Retrograde. from the rest of the moon, so it was a and captured... A... Yeah, so it was... Ca... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, or orbits retrograde and in almost a perfect circle. The eccentricity of, of Triton's orbit is like 0. 0.0002 or something. It's, it's about the most circular orbit for a natural body in the solar system, which is really odd considering it's a likely capture. Um, the, the other thing here, though, is, I mean, we talked about the wide variety of comets and, uh, and material that comes from the Oort cloud. Well, you know, Pluto's out there in the Kuiper belt, and we really don't have a very good idea about anything um, out there. It's very hard to make any kind of spectroscopic measurements of objects that are that distant from the sun. So, it, you know, we're saying, well, maybe it'll look like Triton, but, you know, chances are there's, there, it's, it's going to look like something else, because you know, there's just this wide variety, and we just don't know very much about the Kuiper Belt at all. Yeah, yeah. Still, uh, I, I think it, it will be interesting. I mean, oh, that, yeah. that's going to be a great mission in 2015. They'll uh, starting in early 2015. They'll get pictures of Pluto that are better than what you see from the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, you know, a lot get, better oh, than what you see yeah. from the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> right. Eventually, <laughs> yeah. But, and us uh, writers won't have to keep circulating the same six pictures over and over again. <laughs> because every yeah, time I read an article about Pluto, we're like, there's yeah. only two or three pictures to pick from. I know. I've been <laughs> intending to like commission a bunch of you know, new 3D images of Pluto that we could use. Mm -hmm. But Triton has cryovolcanoes. It's got that interesting cantaloupe terrain. And so I think that's those are a couple of things that people are going to want to look for on Pluto as well, uh, whether there's any sort of volcanic activity uh, that's kind of ice-based uh, rather than uh, lava-based. So. Now, I got an interesting uh, just comment here from Colin Jones, uh, and, I, and I can't verify this, so I could be, you know, retelling uh, myth true, uh, you know, errors here. But uh, so some information on the Proton M explosion. Investigations suggest that it lifted off half a second early. The onboard computer recognized it had done so, and therefore the engines were not at full thrust. So it performed an emergency oh, yes. abort maneuver, and it deliberately got the rocket away from the launch pad, so that when it came back down, it didn't take out the pad. Apparently. Interesting. That must be new. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, I haven't heard that either. So, so this is breaking. Thanks, Colin. And uh, and if you're just trolling us, then thanks, Colin. <laughs> uh, well done. That was very, you know, a very elaborate troll. Uh, so, um, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to sort of wrap things up then. So first, if you're enjoying this and you want to see all of the stuff that happens on the sort of on the channel as well as the the virtual star parties and stuff, I highly recommend that you subscribe. 
it's over here, it's over there. I, I don't know, it's all reversed. Um, the other thing is, and that, that way you'll get notifications of the new things we do on the, on the YouTube channel. Um, and then, uh, right, and so the next thing we're going to be doing is on Sunday night, we're going to be doing the virtual star party. And, I don't know, we're going to have a terrible moon. No moon? No moon. No moon. No moon, no moon. No moon. No moon this, no moon this weekend. weekend. Good. I Finally. might be able to bring Saturn. I that would be... Got my scope here. Right yes, here. please. Yes, please. That would be fabulous. So. We love Saturn. Um, okay, great. So, Alan Boyle, where can people find out more about you? Well, you can go to cosmiclog.com, that works, or science.nbcnews.com, B0YLE on, on Twitter. Uh, that, should, that should get you there. And they've totally redesigned your front page now. It looks like Pinterest. <laughs> well, I hope that's a compliment. <laughs> it is. It is. A bunch of big pictures. We all love pictures. It's great. Uh, Sandy, where can we find out more? You can find me at Sandy on Twitter these days. Awesome. <laughs> because I have uh, a real job. I don't have that much time for writing. I know. I know. <laughs> well, not a real job. I have another job. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, a, a job we're all envious of. Okay, uh, David Dickinson, where do we find out more? I am Astroguys with a Z across all platforms. I'm writing on my own website, www.astroguys.com, although that's mostly sci fi and science books reviews these days. Uh, Listasaur as well, and doing tech writing over there, and I'm currently hanging my hat also at Universe Today. That's a great website. Yay! Uh, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Thad Zabo, where can we find out more? Oh, I'm teaching at Cerritos College. I'll be making more regular appearances on the Virtual Star Party now that I'm completely moved. Um, and again, like I said, now I can set That's up my awesome scope in, in my driveway. Thank you. That looks um, great. What, and, what's the telescope? It's a it's a Celestron Edge HD nine and a quarter inch, um, cool. on a CGM mount. So yeah, thanks. It was always my <laughs> present to myself for finally finishing my PhD. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so yeah, so it should be uh, VSPs and hopefully again now with having finally moved, have some time to write some stuff, get get it out on Universe today. That's true. So, yeah. yeah. Or on Twitter oh, other... at Astrothad. So Astro. sorry. <laughs> sorry. Gr also, if you uh, want to follow the Observatory Cats of Arecibo Observatory, they have their own uh, Twitter account. They're Observatory Cats on Twitter and Observatory Cats on Tumblr. <laughs> and, so, and photos have, of cats interspersed with photos of the observatory. And you have no part in that? You're not the one? I have no part in that whatsoever. Okay. They All just right. magically show up. Um, okay. All right. That's awesome. So, at, what was it again? Observatory Cats? Observatory Cats, yes. No, no Zs. That's fantastic. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone for taking out this. Uh, I, it's a holiday. What is it? Thanksgiving in the United States? I forget what this is. <laughs> um, yeah. So thanks for thanks for taking the time. It's out America here. Day. America like, Day. It's like that, Canada Day, but it's for America. Oh, okay. Okay. I understand. Like or Victoria Day. Yeah. For, to celebrate Queen Victoria. Um, uh, okay. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone for watching, and we will see you all uh, next time. Okay. Happy Apelian Day. Happy Apelian Day. Happy, happy, happy it's all inward from here. <laughs>